So this is a picture of how the cerebellum works. It's an extremely uh, stereotyped circuit that is repeated over and over and over again. And as we noted in the brain area chapter, there's half of the neurons in your brain are in the cerebellum and most of those neurons are called granule cells. And they're in this kind of granule cell layer here and they get activated by these mossy fibers that come up out of the uh, input areas into the, that send information into the cerebellum. Uh, this is the sensory information about your current muscle state and all the sensory information coming in from the parietal lobe. Um, and it just gets separated out by having many, many different possible granule cells that could represent this information. And they are all competing in an inhibitory com competitive way by virtue of, for example, these Golgi cells. There's also basket cells ensure that a very different pattern of activity is active in the granule cell layer for every different configuration. And so if we go back to this diagram, the idea is that if you have a lot of inhibition in this cerebellar layer, each of these little circles is a granule cell. Um, if only a very small number of these can get active at any time, then it's highly unlikely, just statistically, that uh, even if there's overlap in the input, that these very sparse patterns will overlap in the output. Furthermore, we think in the cerebellum there's some kind of active uh, dynamics over time that cause different shifting patterns of activity to get activated. And we'll see that when we look at the model. So the idea is the sensory information comes in through the muscle fibers, activates this very sparse pattern in the granule cell layer, and then that gets sent through these uh, very stereotyped parallel fibers that you can see here synapsing on the Purkinje cell layer. And the Purkinje cell is one of the most amazing cells in your brain. Um, there are relatively few of these relative especially to the number of granule cells. So there may be a hundred thousand synapses from granule cells onto a single Purkinje cell. So an order of magnitude or more more than what we've talked about for typical cortical cells. Um, so these dendrites are just spectacularly huge and they're just kind of sampling this huge range of different granule cells and the idea is that the sensory input information is getting kind of blown up into this very high dimensional space in the granule cell layer. And it's the job of the Purkinje cell to kind of collapse that space back down into a, the original lower dimensional space that's important for actual motor control. And so there's actually a pretty reasonable association in primary motor areas for the uh, Purkinje cells relating to particular muscle fibers that, 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 that get innervated. And so these are really the output of the cerebellum, collecting that high dimensional information, collapsing it back down into motor space. So you can really see overall that the cerebellum is transforming from sensory inputs that it gets in, in great abundance, uh, and then transforming those into this kind of motor coordinate system, uh, the output of the Purkinje cells going down into the spinal cord and activating those and modulating really those uh, motor control systems. But the cerebellum is fundamentally a motor system. It is true that there are some cognitive uh, uh, contributions that the cerebellum makes, but by what we're referring to here is the vast majority of the cerebellum, which is interconnected with the, the motor system. The other really fascinating and critical aspect of the cerebellar system is the presence of these climbing fibers which wrap around the Purkinje cells and these are known to provide the learning signal for the cerebellum. And the key learning signal here is some kind of error as we talked about, a signal that indicates that something hasn't quite gotten right with the motor control. And the, the, the major you know, $64,000 question with the cerebellum is, how does it know when an error has been made? And how does, it, how does the, these climbing fibers, which come from the inferior olivary nucleus, again, a kind of term that describes the shape of this nucleus, they are the key to, to understanding how the cerebellum works because they drive learning in the Purkinje cells according to these error signals. And uh, Mar and Albus uh, both recognize the importance of this overall circuit, the main functionality of this circuit in terms of this learning signal coming from the, the inferior olive through the climbing fibers. 
and Marr in particular emphasized this importance of this very high dimensional space in the granule cell layer, layer. And so this general idea has remained very current and very uh, applicable to understanding how the cerebellum works. There's a lot of interesting details about kind of oscillatory timing and uh, some very much more complexity about how this learning signal works than in the original uh, models, but the same principles really seem to apply here. Prior to the advent of these deep neural network models, uh, many machine learning conferences, you know, had, you know, all their papers were about support vector machines. So it was the, the kind of fad before the deep neural networks. The key idea for the support vector machine is that in a, in a low dimensional space, you may want to separate out, for example, all the green uh, points in the space get associated with one kind of motor action in this kind of you know, input-output uh, function approximation learning system. You want to do one thing with these green ones and you want to do another thing with the red ones. But if you just encode this in this two-dimensional space, it's really hard to kind of you know, do something different for points on the interior of this kind of circle uh, versus things that lie on the out exterior. This is kind of like an XOR kind of problem. However, as we saw with XOR, if you blow this up into a very high dimensional space, and this gets more true as you go higher and higher dimensional, um, then all these points that are otherwise kind of clumped together and hard to separate in the low dimensional space kind of spread out and become much easier to separate by finding some kind of critical plane. You can see here this hyperplane drawn in yellow that sort of conveniently separates all of the green points from all the red points allowing you to learn a function that does one thing with the green things and one another thing with the red things. And that's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about a lookup table, this ability to memorize an appropriate action for each of these different kinds of uh, situations, even if they might overlap a lot in the low dimensional input that's coming in. So overall, I think we have a pretty good understanding computationally of how the system works uh, biologically, how that maps onto this really kind of, you know, very, this kind of circuit that's so regular and, and interesting and, and, and well developed that it's crying out for some kind of clear functional explanation. Um, one of the things that we know about the assist circuit is that it's a very feed forward circuit. Um, there's no recurrent connectivity, and this is another theme of these early brain systems, these primitive brain systems. They don't employ any kind of attractor dynamics. Uh, one idea about what's actually happening in this Purkinje cell learning is that it's learning essentially to do some time travel. It's, it's learning from a subsequent mistake that happens later in time to kind of anticipate that mistake and kind of deliver the correction to fix the mistake before it happens. So very much like these kind of time travel movies, you know something's going to happen, you go backwards in time, you do something to change the outcome of history and, and fix it before it happens. Um, and the time delay can occur if the learning essentially has a bit of a delay in how the synapses change so that the pattern of activity that was present in the granule cell inputs is associated uh, with a error signal that comes about 100 milliseconds later. So in other words, when the error signal is activated, the kind of inputs that it's learning about are those that were present 100 milliseconds earlier. And this can happen very easily due to kind of delays like calcium, as we talked about, that's driving learning again in these synapses just like it is in the cortex. Uh, 